safety during engineering work includes connection to power source, installation and replacement of power supplies and batteries, and equipment installation and replacement. This video shows safe operating practices for small and medium-sized shelters only. For large shelters, refer to Part 3, Safe Electrical Operations in Large Shelters and Installation and Operation of Electromechanical Equipment. However, this dream will not come true unless they work safely, especially around electricity. This is today's safety news. Another electrical accident took place in our city yesterday. Working safely with electricity is an issue of major concern. It can affect the health or even the life of anyone. Working with electricity is a high-risk activity, so it is vitally important to follow electrical safety standards. Electrical hazards are easily overlooked. Follow the correct EHS operating standards. Do the sensible thing. Protect your life. Convene a kickoff meeting and explain EHS rules to all members. Thank you all for attending the kickoff meeting. We are doing a DC power supply swap project for our brother M. But the customer requires non-stop cutover of a power supply. Let me show you a full scene of the site and the area in which we will be working. A specialist contractor will handle all work beyond the power meter. Huawei's scope of work is inside the power meter. All of you must pay attention to these five key requirements. In addition, you should confirm with the customer the implementation scheme and any emergency response plans. Then apply for permission to go on-site. No on-site work can start without the permission of the customer. All work with electricity must be done by qualified electricians. Now, let's look at the location of the nearest hospital and transport links so that we can respond to any accident quickly. After the kickoff meeting, the team leader must lead the team through preparing all tools, equipment, and PPE. All the tools and PPE must have product quality certificates and safety logos. All tools that contact human body directly must be insulated. Each time before departure, the team leader must remind team members to bring all certificates, tools, and equipment to the site. When driving, you must follow the absolute safety rules. Team members arrive at the site on time and collect their PPE. Check the tools again. Make sure there is no damage to the exterior or insulation. Safety helmets. No damage, cracks, or deformation. No damage to the helmet liner. The helmet headband is in good condition and firmly connected to the helmet. The strap is not corroded or scratched. Clip is complete and working. You must scrap and replace any helmet that has had an impact. Do not use it again. Fluorescent vest. No damage. Insulating gloves. Conduct inflation test before use. Do not use gloves with any damage. Insulating shoes. Check labels to confirm that shoes are certified for the voltages in the site environment and to local electrical safety standards. Do not use any insulating shoes if they are damp. Electrical tools. 
must have safety marks and inspection marks. Latest inspection must be within the last year. No cracks or damage to the exterior or handle. Protective earthing wire is properly connected. The power cable and plug have no damage. The power switch moves normally and has no damage or cracks. Electrical and mechanical protective devices have no damage. Rotating parts move smoothly with no resistance. Insulating tools. Check that hand holds are properly insulated with no damage or cracks in the insulation. Clip-on grounding resistance tester, multimeter. Check that meters have correct rating and functions. Check that the precision meets the requirements. Check that the jaws of the clip-on meter are large enough for cables and copper bar. Check that the meter has power, fully charged, working batteries. Check that the electrical contacting function of the probe is functioning properly. Ladders. Ladders must be made of wood, fiberglass or other non-conducting materials. Before starting work, check that everyone is wearing PPE correctly. Take photos of all workers' pass IDs and upload them on ISDP Smart QC. On-site work cannot start until the site engineer has examined the photos and approved the subcontractor to begin. Make sure that all workers are in good physical health. Anyone who is not healthy enough to work is forbidden to work. Hold a meeting before you start. The team leader assigns specific tasks to team members and reminds everyone of the PPE requirements, safety precautions and emergency procedures. Where the work involves electrical equipment, only qualified electricians are allowed to touch any electrical equipment. Help each other to stay aware and make sure no one gets an electric shock. After arriving at the site, tape off the working area. The working area must be large enough to comply with safety regulations. If you can, assign an on-site safety officer to help prevent any safety risks. Put warning signs with the EHS absolute rules on the wall of the equipment room and PPE requirements for electrical work, emergency contact numbers, and emergency procedures. Operations on power supplies shall comply strictly with the engineering documents. Step 1. Install a new power supply cabinet. Make sure the floor space is clear. Use an electric drill to drill mounting holes as required. Electrical equipment must have the correct kind of plug. Non-matching plugs must not be forced into the wrong kind of socket. Make sure the plug is inserted before turning on the tool. Warning! Wear insulating gloves and insulating shoes while operating with electricity. Wear safety goggles to avoid fragments injuring your eyes. After the power supply cabinet is in position, connect the grounding connector of the cabinet to the grounding bar in the shelter. Connect the equipment to the grounding connection of the cabinet. The grounding connections must meet quality standards. There are six problems in this picture. This connection is not covered with insulating tape. Bare wire means risk of electric shock. Useless wire ends have not been clipped away. Connection without OT terminal. No insulating tape on the ground terminal. No insulating gloves. Screws have not been tightened so the wire can move. No insulating tape. Ground resistance testing for the power cabinet. Using a more modern testing tool is recommended. The clip-on ground resistance tester is easy to operate. Test process. 1. Before the test, operate the jaws once or twice to make sure that the jaws fit together well. 2. Turn on the tester. It will first run self-diagnostics. When it is finished, the screen will show 0 ohm. It will automatically be in resistance measurement mode. 3. Squeeze the trigger to open the clamp jaws. Clamp onto the ground wire and wait for the display to settle. Step 2. Connect cables.
First of all, let's look at the AC power system. It distributes AC power from the mains supply or the generator to the equipment in the shelter, such as the air conditioner, lighting, and DC power supply. In the lower left corner is the AC input switch. It usually has three options, mains supply, disconnected, and generator. In the lower right is the surge protector. It prevents damage to the power circuits and electrical equipment when the site is struck by lightning. The left upper module sends AC power to the two air conditioners. This site also has an air conditioner controller. The right upper module is an AC distribution box. It distributes AC power to the DC power supply, lighting, and wall sockets. The input to the DC power supply must come from the AC distribution box. Let's connect the AC distribution box to the new power cabinet. One. In the AC distribution box, find the breaker which will be used for the power supply. The engineering design document will tell you which circuit breaker it is. 2. Check that there is a residual current circuit breaker. 3. Test the circuit breaker switch to make sure that it is functioning properly, then reset it to connected. 4. Make sure that the circuit breaker is off disconnected on the AC input in the AC distribution box and the power cabinet before connecting cables. 5. Make sure that the sequence and position of the cables are correct, screws are tightened, and that all connections meet quality standards. Space is limited inside the distribution box. Take care not to cause an electric shock or short circuit. After that, a second qualified electrician should inspect the cables to ensure that they are correctly connected. If the distribution box has a cover, replace it after you connect all the cables to prevent anyone else from accidentally touching a connection. Step 3. Connect the battery to the power cabinet. Now we need to connect the storage battery to the new power supply. One. First, make sure that the fuses have been removed from the battery circuits of both the old and new power cabinets. 2. Connect the battery to the new power supply. Make sure that the cables are connected to the right battery terminals. 3. Check that the connections are correct and that screws are tight. Replace the fuse in the power cabinet. Do not allow any metal object to touch two or more battery terminals at the same time. Do not allow any metal object to touch battery terminals and grounded equipment, for example, the power cabinet. This can cause short circuit, spark, or explosion. Make sure batteries are connected the right way round. Connect the negative terminal first, then the positive terminal. Tighten battery cables to the correct level of torque using a torque wrench. Loose connections can cause high voltage drop, which can generate intense heat and even cause a fire. Step 4. Power on test. 1. Before turning on the power at the distribution box, check that no tools or materials, which could cause a short circuit, remain inside the cabinet. Check that the AC wiring is correct and that the connectors have been tightened. 2. Switch on the AC input and observe the startup process. When the controller LCD indicates that the system voltage is around 54 volts, use a multimeter to measure the voltage at the bus bar. When it is the same as the voltage indicated on the controller LCD, it means that the power system is functioning normally. Free. Set parameters as in the engineering documents. Step 5. Non-stop cutover. Next, let's look at safety precautions during cutover. This shows how the old power cabinet is connected. Switch off the cutover circuit breaker on the new cabinet. Then, switch off the circuit 1 circuit breaker on the old cabinet. Connect the circuit 1 cables to the new cabinet. Make sure the positive and negative terminals are connected correctly. Before switching on the circuit breaker in the new cabinet, we need to set the output voltage of the new power supply. The 
output voltage difference between the old and the new power supply must be less than 0.5 volts. It is recommended that the new voltage should be about 0.2 volts less than the old supply. If the difference is more than 0.5 volts, arcing and sparks may occur when the circuit breaker is switched on. When the voltage stabilizes and the output voltage of the new power supply is 53.3 volts, switch on the breaker to connect this circuit. After switching on the circuit breaker, adjust the output voltage of the new power supply little by little. Increase by 0.1 volt each time and do not make the next adjustment until the voltage stabilizes. Stop adjusting when the output voltage of the new power supply is about 0.2 volts higher than that of the old one. After the voltage is stable, measure the output current on the old power supply. When the current is zero, it means that the load has been switched to the new power supply. If the output current is not zero, arcing or sparks may occur when the cables are disconnected. Now switch off the breaker of the second circuit of the old power supply, then cut over the cables of the second circuit to the new power supply. Switch on the circuit breaker for the second circuit on the new power supply. Check that the equipment is running normally. Space is limited. If a screwdriver or wrench touches a positive and negative terminal at the same time, it could cause a short circuit. When using a ladder, be sure to plant the ladder firmly. Keep tools and accessory materials in proper places so that nothing can fall into the cabinet and cause short circuit and fire. Step 6. Remove the old power cabinet. Switch off the AC circuit breakers and remove the fuses on the battery and power circuits. Then, disconnect the AC input cables, circuit cables, and battery cables. Finally, remove the old power cabinet. EHS requirements for new build and upgrade scenarios are basically the same. The installation procedure is as follows. One. Install new equipment for a site. In the new build scenario, all equipment is new and must be installed to the positions indicated in the engineering design document. 2. Connect cables. For AC cable connection instructions, see part 2 of this video. For DC cable connections, see the DC wiring instructions for cutovers. 3. Connect the batteries. For details, see part 3. 4. Power on test. For details, see part 4. If someone gets an electric shock, switch off all circuit breakers immediately. Ensure your own safety first and follow these rules as you give first aid. 1. A qualified electrician immediately cuts the power supply. 2. Qualified first aid personnel give first aid following the proper first aid procedures. 3. Call the local emergency services. Tell them what has happened and your location. The emergency services will send medical help. 4. Notify your Huawei supervisor by phone or using the HSOS app. When the ambulance arrives, the medical personnel will begin first aid and bring a stretcher from the ambulance. Help the medical personnel to move the injured person onto the stretcher and then carry the stretcher to the ambulance. The team leader will go to the hospital in the ambulance. We dream of a beautiful life, but this dream will not come true unless we work safely. For your own health and safety, for the happiness of your family, please always follow all EHS safety regulations.